tell you what, ladies and gentlemen, take note. Our next guest is a noted professor of philosophy. So what? Take note, and then he said he's noted. So he's, because you took a note, because you did what I asked you to do, right? That's why you're the chairman. The chairman! Okay, uh, ladies and gentlemen, a noted professor with a deep knowledge of Socrates, Plato, and philosophy of theater. He has written quite a bit. If you Google his name, he is the first one to come up. <laughs> Pretty good. Here to present the birth of tragedy from the spirit of music, please welcome Dr. Paul Woodruff. Yeah. Dionysos, there follows a, a prayer from a Greek tragedy to, to induce uh, Dionysus to make his presence uh, in the theater. Many Greek tragedies include a chorus known as a cletic ode, which is an invitation to the god of the theater, Dionysus. All theater spaces were sacred to Dionysus. Uh, this uh, prayer comes from the Antigone. He's not a, Dionysus is not a character in the Antigone, but of course uh, the audience comes uh, with the hope that through music and dance and prayer, the god will make his presence known in the theater. Uh, perhaps uh, he might be seen uh, as a beautiful young man or as a bull or a lion. He took many shapes. Uh, but more likely he's not seen, but simply uh, felt through the spirit with which he infuses uh, his, uh, his, uh, the, the worshipers. So this is from the Antigone. O leader in the dance of stars that circled across the night, breathing fire. O shepherd of dark voices, child of Zeus, let us see you now. Come, O Lord, with your throng of maenads, Eacus, steward of joy. Grant them ecstasy to dance all night for you. Io pur pleon ton coragas tron lucion, thegmaton episcope, pai dios genethlon, profaneth. O nax ai sama peripolois, thu ai sen ai sen mine men ai panukoi kor eusi ton tamion iancon. Inspired by Dionysus as he'd come to appreciate his power through the study of Greek tragedy, a young classic scholar in 1871, uh, just back from service in a rather violent war, published a book that absolutely ruined his career and reputation as a scholar, but was the most important book about ancient Greece written in modern times, I think. The scholar was Friedrich Nietzsche, the brightest scholar of his time. The book, The Birth of Tragedy from the Spirit of Music. Its thesis and what made it so important was that the German, primarily German scholars who had uh, praised ancient Greece for its clear and simple and direct uh, rationality were all wrong about what was going on in Greece. It wasn't the rational that animated the Greek culture. It was the irrational, and the rational was there you know, to, to, to keep the irrational from getting out of check. But it was the irrational that animated the culture. The irrational represented by Dionysus, who, as you've heard, uh, was the god not merely of wine. Wine was just one of the many things that he sponsored in human life. Uh, he was uh, the god of uh, ecstasy, which was achieved by the Maenads, I think, more often not by dancing, but not, not by drinking alcohol, but by dancing, dancing into a state of bliss. 
uh, something you can easily imagine. He was also, as you've heard, a god of fertility. And he was a god uh, because he had uh, died and come back to life. Uh, he was a god especially honored by those who, who wished something like that would happen to them. Uh, and in fact, if you, if you uh, read more about Dionysus, you'll discover that there was a, a cult of Dionysus, uh, sometimes joined with Demeter and Kore, uh, through which uh, you would uh, ob obtain a special relationship with the divine. You would go through a period of instruction and then be led out of a very dark place into a light, into the light. And that uh, passage from the dark into the light is, of course, symbolic of, of, of a second birth. As you've heard, Dionysus had a second birth. And the Dionysus worshipers who went through this initiation were then born again into a special relationship with the god, which promised them a better deal after death. What most fascinated Nietzsche about Dionysus is the way in which uh, the uh, ecstasy that Dionysus provides breaks down the barriers between one individual person and another, and at the same time breaks down the barriers between human beings and nature itself. Swept up in music, we are in a glorious transport that arises even from the depths of nature. And in this transport, we can grasp the terrible truth of human suffering without pain. But there's a huge but here. Dionysus and the irrational forces that he unleashed needs to be contained. The festival must take place only for a few days, because otherwise things would get terribly out of hand. Dionysus needs to be contained. And on Nietzsche's theory that the Greeks cultivated Apollo precisely because they felt the power of Dionysus and needed Apollo as a symbol of enchantment, of illusion, of mimesis, of structure, and of order. The beauty that Apollo provides banishes suffering, wrote Nietzsche. These two, Dionysus and Apollo, uh, are in a way equally important, though it's Dionysus first. Dionysus speaks the language of Apollo, says Nietzsche, but Apollo finally speaks the language of Dionysus. And therefore, the highest goal of tragedy and of all art is reached when each of these gods speaks the language of the other. There's no point in asking who is more important. Neither one can affect our lives without the other. Dionysus is the god of theater. All theaters are sacred spaces for Dionysus, and so is this during a theatrical episode such as this. So let me chant once more to Dionysus. Uh, this, uh, this passage comes uh, from uh, the Bacchae, about which we're going to hear more later. But I wanted you to hear something about the, the rhythms that go with the Bacchic worship in the uh, opening chorus of the play, the Bacchae by Euripides, uh, there are lines which, for all we know, come from actual uh, liturgy uh, to, for the worship of Dionysus. Uh, oh, I, I, there's one other thing that I, I think you may have picked this up from what you've already heard about Dionysus, but you, when you run wild in the mountains and eat uh, wild animals, you're consuming the blood and the flesh of the god and putting the god inside you through, through eating uh, what you eat. So here's a little bit uh, from the opening chorus of the Bacchae. Eat a bankai, eat a bankai, bromion paida theon theu, dinison cargusai, frugion exorion, elados es, eurucorus, aguios ton bromion. Run, Bacchae, run, Bacchae, bring the god, the son of a god, thunderer Dionysus, down from the mountains of Phrygia, down to Greece, Bromius, 
the Thunderborn. He was born when, as the fates said, his time came, a god with his bull's horns and crowned with his snake crown. That is why in their wild hair the maenads weave predator serpents. Etekhen, danik, moirai, telesan, taurika, ron, thon, stephanosen, ectrakonton, stephanoi, zentamagron, the rotophon, mine at his amphi, balante, plakamois. Nietzsche ends the birth of tragedy with a beautiful paragraph. Walking beneath high ionic peristyles, looking toward a horizon defined by pure and noble lines, seeing on either hand the glorious reflections of his shape in gleaming marble. Would he not call out, blessed Greeks, how great must be your Dionysus if, the, if Apollo thinks such enchantments necessary to cure your dithyrambic madness? To one so moved an ancient Athenian with the august countenance of Aeschylus might reply, but you should add, extraordinary stranger, what suffering must this race have endured in order to achieve such beauty now, come with me to tragedy and let us sacrifice in the temple of both gods. Thank you. Yes, questions? yes, yes. He will entertain questions, people. Have you any? Uh, yes. Uh, the question was, is there any connection to Christianity in this uh, idea of ritually going into the mountains uh, to, uh, to partake of the, of the gods, flesh and blood? Uh, as uh, one scholar has noted, uh, the worship of Dionysus was a theophagus, or God-eating cult. It's not the only one. Uh, as, you, as you know, there are other cults in which it's important that people ingest uh, what they believe to be the god. Uh, are there connections between uh, Dionysus and Christianity? I, I think from a Christian point of view, one could, might say that Dionysus worship prefigured Christianity. There are many parallels. You've heard them, the, the virgin, uh, the virgin uh, mother and, and all the rest. Uh, and, and of course, there are, the parallels are not, are not perfect. Uh, so a, 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 a a Christian view has been that, that many pagan religions prefigured Christianity. Uh, but there may also be an historical explanation that as uh, Christianity moved out of the Jewish and into the Greek world, it incorporated elements from Greek mystery religion, of which this is not the only one. They all had this common feature of initiation uh, into a special relationship with the God and a kind of second birth. Uh, Bacchus is just another name for Dionysus. Uh, Bacchus, Iacus, Dionysus, it's all the same. Uh, he is uh, uh, primarily known as the god of wine, but it's uh, uh, only really a, a small part of his portfolio. Uh, he has an enormous portfolio. Did Plato believe in Dionysus and the other Greek gods? Uh, that's a really interesting question. Uh, I think uh, that Plato most likely was actually uh, a monotheist. Uh, he believed in a, I think, in a single morally perfect god, and he would uh, would have uh, he he had strong negative feelings about the stories told about Dionysus because he really he really is horrible if you. If you don't believe in him, he destroys you. If you do, he gives you joy. Uh, and Plato would not have liked this, this approach to the god. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the language of initiation, uh, that is a process through which uh, you come to understand your world in, in, in a totally new way uh, through your relationship with the spiritual, this is something that Plato took over from the mystery religions and it is built into his philosophy. 
So the description, for example, uh, you may have heard of the cave in the Republic and the, the ordinary people who were stuck in the cave and the philosophers who were able to get out of the cave uh, and come out into the light and see the truth. Uh, that image comes from uh, this initiation ritual. I think we have one more in the back. Yes. Okay, I'll, I hope my voice carries. It does. Great. Um, <laughs> with the story of Dionysus and Apollo, are they represented in the two drama masks that are also seen? Uh, so the question is whether Apollo and Dionysus are represented in the masks of which you see theaters, uh, in theaters. Uh, I think only when they would appear as characters on stage. The, uh, uh, the, the pictures you've seen are probably not accurate representations of the masks that were actually used in the Greek theater. I think you're, you're probably thinking of ones that uh, Roman, Roman masks that are sort of fixed in uh, tragic or comic expressions. But each character had a mask which was unique to that character, uh, uh, made of linen, like a sock you put over your head, with hair and a beard, if appropriate. And since there were only three actors in the play, uh, the, uh, the, the masks had to differentiate one character from another. So. I got a whole other interesting <laughs> lecture. Right oh, yeah. There. Well, I could right. go on all night, but I, you. you, you, you May I would, no, you, sorry, you sorry. wouldn't let me do that. <laughs> I'll be back. When we do the uh, puppet head theme. Oh, okay. So, uh, can we take one more? We gotta move on, I guess. All right. Hey, Professor Paul, welcome! By the way, folks, that's uh, that's the, te the theater of Dionysus in the Acropolis in Athens. I was taken by my father, who was just there uh, in Athens a few days ago. Yeah, that was cool. Could we turn our show into a theocopicus? Theocopicus? Yes. Awesome. <laughs> Delicious. Can we hear it one more time for Dr. Paul Woodruff? Yeah.